is called the Dharma Request. And one of our laymen here in Gold Coast is walking around the Buddha with incense. And he's about to bow and then kneel down and make a formal Dharma request. This is the way it was done in the Buddha's time. So we're keeping it going. And he makes his request in two languages, Chinese and English. And then I respond as the person being requested. And I respond in English and Chinese and then in, in uh, Sanskrit, uh, Pali, actually. Pali language, the ancient language that may have been spoken in the Buddha's time. So that's what we're about to do. So I'll be silent now and receive their request. Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambu Dasa Bhagavato Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Sadanto Suchedo ye Olahudi San Miao San Putoshe Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa by Chien Wan Jie Nan Zhao Yu Wu Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Shifu Shangren, Goe Shishung, Aja Omitofo, good evening, everybody in California and around the world. Good afternoon, folks here in the Gold Coast. And if you're listening, in Taiwan or in China. Uh, delighted to be with you today. We're going to be explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra. My name is Reverend Hung Shur, and it is Sunday, July 5th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, of Australia. And it's the 4th of July in the evening in California, which means that because we're at the start of summer, it's still bright light outdoors. Um, but in the next uh, 90 minutes, the fireworks are going to start. And we're going to hear, uh, I won't be hearing them here, but you there will be hearing uh, people celebrating Independence Day. <laughs> and given our topic today, that's very pertinent because our topic in the sutra today is called 
Chietua, Chietua, Vimukti, uh, Vimoksha, which means freedom, liberation. And oh my goodness, uh, that is a pertinent topic, by golly. Uh, okay, uh, we heard, let's see here, he says the network has become bad after the Dharma request. All right. Um, I only see my modem. Is your modem up? Yeah, let's, let's see. We want everybody, let's see. Are there two 4G devices sharing the network? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. He's, the question was, are there two 4G devices sharing the network? So. No, only one. Only one? Yeah. Oh. Oh, are you on the new system? We are on the cable. On the cable, I see. So no, okay. So there is, okay. Anyway, we, uh, I have a, a great uh, session today of storytelling to share with everybody, and I want it to be, I want you all to, to be able to hear and see what we're about. So let's uh, make sure that, uh, keep me posted there, uh, tech team, okay. Your modem just popped up. Maybe I can switch to it. Can I do it? All right. Hold on now. If everything breaks down, I'll be right back. Don't go away. Okay. So now I'm on another modem. Let me know if that one's better. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm Hung Shur. This is something that we do every week, except last week we didn't. Oh, your internet connection's unstable, it says. Yeah, I get a message across. My phone. We'll try our best. Okay, still red. Oh, video froze. Tell me when we're good. Is it better? Are we back? Audio is good, he says. Okay, how about now? No. Goodness gracious, okay. Namo Guanyin Pusa. Well, I will say we're in the last week of retrograde Mercury, if that makes any difference. We hope that uh, we will be, uh, you know what's, uh, many people are home. Video is moving now, okay. Last time we had to log out and rejoin when switch network. Let me try that, okay. Go away and come right back, see you later. Bye-bye. Now, I'm back. Let's see if that is an improvement. Okay. All right. Now, let's see. It's good now. Good. We've got a system going. Okay. So, welcome back. And uh, today we're going to look into the topic of what? The sutra is telling us about the bodhisattva's liberation. This is a big word in the in every Buddhist tradition. Um, we'll just start. I'll let the sutra do the talking. So here's our text for today. And Sam, I'm on page 32. It is Chietko is our topic. I'll make it a little bigger so you can see it all. Okay, I'm going to be reading this long paragraph for folks who don't speak any Chinese. Um, you're welcome to follow along in the Romanized alphabet below each individual character. You'll see that, right? Oh, you know what we haven't done? We haven't invoked spiritual presence yet. Let's do that first. I got thrown off my stride by our technological issues. So here we go. I'm going to chant inviting the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly to draw near. And... Give me 
a second here. It's better when it's in tune. Let's put our palms together should you choose to join me and we're going to be doing this in Chinese and again you can follow the romanization underneath right Namo da fang guang fu page 52 where our topic is page 32 our topic is liberation and in typical Avatamsaka sutra style we hear that word jieto 10 times repeated over this is the teaching of totality so we're going to hear that word jieto here it is in chinese right there anybody who wants to see what it looks like and uh this is the Buddha's word. These are the Buddha's words. So I'm going to put my palms together as I read them. Then we'll switch over and do the English. Okay, everybody ready? Here we go. Fozi Pusa Mohasa Zhu Ci Di Ji De Pusa Bu Si Yi Jie Tuo Wu Zhang Ai Jie Tuo Jing Guan Cha Jie Tuo Pu Zhao Ming Jie Tuo Ru Lai Zhang Jie Tuo Sui Shun Wu Ai Lun Jie Tuo Tong da san shi jie tuo, fa jie zang jie tuo, guang ming lun jie tuo, wu yu jing jie jie tuo, ci shi wei shou, yu wu liang bai qian yi e sheng, wu liang bai qian e sheng qi jie tuo man, jie yu ci di, ah, sorry, slow down here, jie yu ci di shi di zhong de, Rushi Naiji Wu Liang Bai Chen E Sung Chi San Mei Man Wu Liang Bai Chen E Sung Chi Tuoloni Man Wu Liang Bai Chen E Sung Chi Shen Tong Man Shi Jie Cheng Jiu Here we go. All right. The text comes back to life here in the 21st century. Ready? We are now going to read the English same way. Join me. Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha. When the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, abides on this stage, he attains the Bodhisattva's inconceivable liberation, the unobstructed liberation, the immaculate contemplation liberation, the liberation of radiance shining everywhere, the Tathagata's treasury liberation, the liberation that accords with the unobstructed wheel, the liberation that connects through three periods of time, the treasury of the Dharma realm liberation, the wheel of light, liberation, and the states without remainder, liberation. These 10 are foremost, but there are limitless hundreds of thousands of asankhyas of doors of liberation in all, and he realizes them all in the 10th stage. It is the same with limitless hundreds of thousands of asankhyas of samadhis, limitless hundreds of thousands of asankhyas of dharanis, and limitless hundreds of thousands of asankhyas of psychic powers, 
all of which he fully realizes. Great. Okay, now to do the, uh, our conventions as we explain, I want to say that the bodhisattva's pronoun can be male or female, male, masculine or feminine. If you want to say she, works just fine, no difference. So uh, bodhisattvas are able to switch their bodies um, out of human form into animals, ghosts, birds, devas, you know, other bodhisattvas, pracheka buddhas, travakas, hell dwellers, uh, buddhas bodies. So no limit. So you can certainly go back and forth in the human dharma realm between male and female. No worries. Uh, any race, any species, any skin tone, right? Any language base, any culture works fine because the bodhisattva, uh, which is what our text is about, right? This is about how bodhisattvas practice. The point of this is that they come alive in order to communicate, in order to teach. That's their purpose. And they want to teach useful, valuable lessons so that people who are not liberated by any means can find these, they call them doors to liberation, gateways to, to freedom from whatever is oppressing them or tying them up. So certainly pronoun doesn't matter. What else? Um, our conventions before we launch into the words of the text. Let's look at the language of it. We'll scan down the text to see what are the, the new language, the new words that may be unusual, right? So this is a bodhisattva mahasattva, a great leader among bodhisattvas who is uh, being discussed here. Um, we're on the 10 stages chapter, the 10th stage. And this bodhisattva attains, first of all, an inconceivable liberation. So usually the way these are set up is the first sentence is the theme. Then there are nine variations that follow, 10 in all. So the first one is inconceivable chiatoa, liberation, all right? And that word chiatoa, I'm gonna go flip over to my notes page. And on my notes page, I've got, here's the Chinese chiatoa for it, two characters. And it means literally to untie, to, if you have a knot, you're tied up, you untie it. So the strands are free. Um, Sanskrit word for that, and this text was probably first Sanskrit uh, or Pali or some Indic language, moksha is moksha, also called vimoksha, vimukti and mukti. Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and Sikhs all borrow this word. It's a really uh, popular, useful word for religions that come from India and Southeast Asia. And what do we have in English that corresponds it? We have emancipation, right? We think right away, Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863. Enlightenment, popular word. That word will get you, somebody will buy you a beer if you talk about enlightenment. We don't drink beer. Liberation, uh, release. How about release, mukti, moksha and vimukti, vimoksha. Talks about release, meaning something's held in, held tight, right? The door is shut, the key is, the lock is turned, the key is thrown away, and the key comes back, the lock opens, the door opens, go free. Freedom. Question is, what's the difference between moksha, vimoksha, vimukti, and mukti? Uh, and jetor and freedom and liberation and enlightenment. Nirvana is a synonym that people have used for these words in Indic languages. The Buddhists talk about nirvana. So what's the difference? Hmm. I'll ask that question and then let folks chew on it. What do you think about that? What is nirvana in terms of liberation? Hmm. So I've got another useful, helpful uh, set of definitions here, which says release from the bonds of earthly desires. Earthly desires. Also delusion, 
also suffering, and then a key word, transmigration. Buddhism sets forth various kinds and stages of emancipation or enlightenment. The supreme emancipation is nirvana, a state of perfect quietude, freedom, and deliverance. Hmm. Okay. Sometimes this language gets in the way. Doesn't help. So what, what is a good, simple kitchen definition of nirvana? And it, we would say no further coming and going. No more moving. Moving from where? From one body to the next at death. What the Buddha did, our historical Buddha, was he stopped samsara, which is con continuity, continuing from one body, dying, going to another body. He stopped that, got free. He emancipated, liberated, set free from needing to be reborn again. So put it in other language, uh, the birth of the prince Siddhartha Gautama was his last birthday. No more happy birthday to you. No more cake and candles, right? Whatever the Indian equivalent of it was, happy birthday. So that's a big deal because coming into being, being born again, getting old, getting sick, dying is a lot of trouble, a lot of pain, a lot of misery, the opposite of freedom, emancipation, liberation. So that's the big deal. That's what this means. And the Buddha, interestingly, uh, as he, now I'm, I don't want to go into definition too far yet. We're still working with language, right? For those of us who are paying attention to the formality of explaining a text, doing Buddhist commentary, right? There's a, there's a method, there's a technique. So we're still in the language level. Uh, so I, I will save my comments for that. Let's go on down. We've got unobstructed, immaculate contemplation, radiant shining everywhere, treasury, according with an unobstructed wheel. How about that? Connecting through three periods of time, treasury of the Dharma realm, wheel of light, and then states without remainder. All those various kinds of liberation. And that's what we're going to be digging into as we come back to it. Um, let's move on down to the conclusion of the paragraph. It says, these 10 are foremost, but there are limitless hundreds of thousands of asankhya. What in the world is an asankhya? That's a Sanskrit word, which means beyond counting. Wuliang, wuliang shu, right? Your, your calculator goes, gears, can't count it. Too many zeros, no way to count it. An asankhya of what? Gateways to liberation, things you go through to get free. You could say cell, prison cells that you leave, right? Uh, places that you don't want to be that you can get away from. And in the 10th stage, our bodhisattva realizes them all. Okay, now as if that weren't enough, then there's another paragraph where it gives us, it says, just like these liberation, plural, like these liberations, same samadhis, dharanis, psychic powers, the bodhisattva also at this stage, masters, right? What's our verb? Realizes. This bodhisattva brings about and, and handles, is good at, not only liberations, but samadhis, dharanis, and psychic powers. What's a samadhi, what's a dharani, what's a psychic power, right? Well, those are bodhisattva's tools. So, that's the language level. We're going to go back up to the top and start down again. And now we're going to do the interpretation part. And the uh, what I want to point out is <coughs> I know don't touch your face right I if anybody's clocking how many times in this lecture I touch my face guilty um, hand sanitizer right wash th those videos that taught us how to wash our hands for COVID-19 um, 
in the Avatamsaka Sutra, a liberation is something similar to a meditative state. It's not just an idea of freedom. It's not a noun. It's, it's an object. It's a state. Did you know? They, they usually lump them together. They say, uh, in, um, I know in the 10 practices chapter, which was back down the, the tree of accomplishment of a bodhisattva, they say a bodhisattva when he is uh, practicing in this, when he's in training, right? This is the, these are instructions for bodhisattvas. When he's in bodhisattva school or she, he attains dhyanas, chan, ing, jieto, samme. Okay, so what are these? These are meditations. This, this means he gets better at meditation. And liberation as a thing, as a state, is uh, something you can measure. It's a little bit like saying, oh, this person has now memorized pi to a hundred places, right? Anybody got a kid, math genius at home, who is able to memorize pi? You know, I know I have a, uh, one of our dear Dharma friends, Rosalind, has a nephew who memorized pi to, you know, a ridiculous number. You just go, dun, 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 keep reciting the numbers. Three point, da, 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 da. So what would be another one? Once you learn to ride a bike, okay? Remember when you learned to ride a bike? Did you? Did you learn to ride a bicycle? Sure, right? And it was scary because you kept falling off or you're afraid you'd fall off and then you could then you could ride a bike without anybody without training wheels without your dad running alongside holding you you know or your big sister did you learn to swim before you learned to swim water was threatening scary terrifying right water is a foreign element alien it will kill you once you learn to swim huh water is just another place where you move through so those abilities, memorizing numbers, playing piano, baking a pie, baking a pie, not calculating a pie, right? Being able to swim, being able to ride a bike, those are skills. The attainment of liberation is also a skill as the sutra describes it. It's like it's a kind of meditative state. So that's one. Maybe somebody can... Uh, chime in and give me more information about that. So the bhikshus who are online listening, our team, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei, Jin He, Jin Fu, if anybody has more information about liberations that fall in line with Chan, Ding, Chia Tuo, Dhyana, Samadhi, liberation, you can certainly welcome to fill in. Um, I believe that they also appear in the Theravada meditation manuals, like the Qingjing Dao, um, the uh, Visuddhimagga. I think they also talk about how you measure somebody's got a jetua, a, a liberation state. So there's more to learn here. Okay. This passage here bounces back and forth. This is what cued me to that state right it's the same with samadhis dharanis and psychic powers the bodhisattva also realizes so how interesting this is not just like freedom anybody anybody see the movie woodstock the uh the actual documentary that was released to the to the movie houses I remember I went with my mother to watch Woodstock. And I was impressed that my mother was willing to sit through it and listen to the music, and she actually liked some of the music. So in, uh, in Woodstock, which is 1969, the uh, millennial moment where young people worldwide, particularly in America, realized that there were a lot of us who agreed. It was nationwide, worldwide. So uh, the Aquarian concert, right? Uh, Max Yasger's farm in Bethel, New York, a million young people joined, came together. Um, before it was a three-day concert, and as they got started, 
um, the, because the New York Thruway was blocked. There were just too many cars coming in. So, so they, the time came to begin and the performers hadn't arrived. They had to come in by helicopter. They had the helicopter in, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and the Jefferson Airplane and Santana and Joe Cocker and everybody. So um, who did they have? So the guy who was the MC, interestingly, a fellow named Chip Monk, by the way. Yep, yep. He's, he, they looked around, they said, who's here? And they said, well, get Richie Havens. Richie Havens is backstage. So Richie Havens was uh, one of our heroes. He was a local folk singer who was in the Midwest, was in New York. He, uh, Richie Havens sang, I, I sang in a club that Richie Havens sang in, you know, back in the day. And he was a real guy big, tall uh, African-American folk singer who played an acoustic guitar. Well, he was backstage. So they brought out Richie Havens. And once he was on stage, here's, you know, a million young people listening to Richie Havens sing. And he's, he sings to houses like 20 at a time, you know, maybe 30. And here he is looking out over the stage. They kept him on for two hours. Richie Havens sang for two hours. And nobody wanted to let him go. <laughs> so uh, the movie, you know, the movie picked the highlights. And uh, the, uh, what they picked out for Richie Havens was his timeless anthem. He's going, freedom, 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 freedom. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And he started out by singing freedom. And he played one chord. Richie Havens is famous for playing one chord. He's strum, 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 strum on one. His left hand doesn't move. He's holding on to one chord. And they say, Richie, why, why didn't you play other chords? He says, I play good chords. I got a good one. I don't want to, why do I need two? This is a good chord. Playing D, you know, the strumming on his guild guitar. So in my, you know, anybody who watched uh, the Woodstock film, got to see Richie Havens singing freedom, 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 freedom. And uh, he has everybody clap along, clap your hands, clap your hands. So here we have a bodhisattva who is going through a bodhisattva's freedoms. He attains the bodhisattva's inconceivable freedom the unobstructed freedom, the immaculate contemplation freedom, right? Well, no, it's chiatoa, but come on, you can translate chiatoa as freedom just fine. So here's the question that we have to ask. Um, oh, and by the way, I need to say, last, not last week, last week we had Master Xuanhua's Nirvana observance, but um, I wanted to share Ed, I wanted to own up. I told you a wrong story two weeks ago. And I got to correct myself, right? I told the story of, uh, set me, please teach me how to get liberated. And the question, the response from the teacher was, well, what's tying you up? Ah, enlightenment, immediately. I put that in the mouth of Bodhidharma. Not, it was Di Sanzu. It was the third. Okay, so here's the true story. Okay, and it's, right, it's there on the, the uh, screen. Anybody wants to see it? Dao Xin, the great master Dao Xin, who was the third Chan patriarch. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Dao Xin, Chan Sandang, was Di Si. He was the fourth one. He, uh, he in India, he was the 31st generation. Dao Xin Da Shi Shi Di Si Dai. Okay, Zong Yin Du Suan Lai. If you count from India, he was number 31, Bodhidharma being 28. Okay, so um, he was born in uh, Chanzhou, Guangxi. He was born to the Sima family. And he, uh, let's see, okay, he was, let's see, yeah. when he in the 14th, at age 14, he was 14 years old, 
and he bowed to Sung San Zushi. Master Sung San was the third Chan patriarch. So I, I was wrong by two generations, my attribution of the story. We're getting to the story about liberation, right? So 14 years old, he bowed to Sung San, great master Sung San, as, as his Shifu. And uh, he asked his teacher, he said, please, please, please teach me a method for Chietua, for liberation, for Vimukti. And great master Dao Xin did. He said, please teach me how to get liberated. So master Sung Han, the third patriarch, was the one who said, Shei Fu Ru, who's tying you up? That's the classic line that I was reaching for last week, last time, and told you wrong. So he said, okay, who's tying you up? Shei Fu Ru, Shei Bang Jun. And so the answer came, Master Dao Xin said, Wu Ren Fu, nobody's tying me up. I, I, I'm, I'm not tied up at all. So Master Dao, Master Sung San says, uh, so Master Sung San said, you came asking me for a doorway to liberation. Well, since we now know nobody's tying you up, then why, are you, why do you need to be set free? And Dao Xin Da Shi Zai Jie Ge Shi Hou Yi Ting Guo Ran Mei You Ren Bang Zhi Ta Jiu Ta Jiu Zi You La Jie Tuo La So he realized, he said, okay, I guess nobody's tying me up. I'm free. I am free. So there we go. That's the Chan story. And I guess you had to be there right, for the actual uh, effect of the words to set you free. But, you know, that's the idea, is when the teacher knows it is your time to be set free, all it takes is a word. What's the difference between before the teacher said it and after the teacher said it? Everything, right? He realized, oh, I'm... Nobody's tying me up. Liberation is something we seek inside. But it still takes the good and wise advisor to say the right word at the right moment for us to get all our ducks in a row, right? For the pieces to mesh, and sure enough, you're free. So that's, that's one of those great stories. And Master Hua would scold me He'd say, Bodhidharma never said that. Why are you slandering the patriarchs? Get your stories right. right? He was a tough disciplinarian when it came time to tell him, of course, you want to love and cherish our tradition. Don't mess around with the tradition. So inconceivable liberation sometimes happens at the fall of a single word. Who's tying you up? Nobody. Okay, you're free. Ah, I'm free. Just that. Unobstructed liberation at that point. Immaculate contemplation liberation. What do you suppose a jing guan cha? I guess it's that you, your glasses are polished, right? You've, you've taken a nice, what do they call it? A microfiber cloth and polished your glasses. You can contemplate immaculately. I'm a stickler for, I don't like smudgy glasses. You want to make me upset, take a big thumbprint right there. Uh, I also like clean windshields. I clean my windshield of my car. I don't like peering through the, you know. Is that a green light? No, I, well, I guess so. You know. <laughs> Oops, right? So Tathagata's treasury liberation, Tathagata's treasury. The Ru Lai Zhang, right? In Chinese, the um, Tathagata's treasury is, oh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. We missed out the liberation of radiance shining everywhere. These are all descriptive, beautiful, poetic language for this process of uncovering our nature. Inconceivable, unobstructed, immaculate contemplation, radiance shining everywhere. When, if we really want to do the work of setting ourselves free, 
we clean off the mirror of our mind. More poetic language, right? This is metaphor for this process called cultivation. And what makes it identifiably Buddhist is that while help can come, encouragement can come from outside, we do it ourselves. Nobody can do it for us. So right away, right away, anybody who has been raised in a tradition where we wait for grace has to recalibrate. If our liberation is waiting for a Messiah, hmm, then we have to recalibrate in order to, to get in sync with the Buddhist notion. So, and somebody says, ah, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is Amitabha? If Amitabha is not a Messiah, you know, what is he? Well, let's look at that question. This is key, I think. Um, when I... Uh, when I did a pilgrimage, uh, bowing on the highway every three steps, um, I and my companion, Marty, Professor Verhoeven, were completely exposed and vulnerable to proselytizers every single day, except when we were out in Big Sur and there was nobody for 60 miles. But anytime we were close to a population center, every day somebody would come out to save us. And I remember, because uh, I was not talking at the time, I was silent, but my ears were wide open. And I remember these preachers coming out and telling us, you're in bondage. You don't recognize it. Why don't you ask Jesus for grace to set you free. Do you think you can work your way to heaven? Only by grace alone are we liberated, right? So what is that? That's a different story, isn't it? Now, you got to give it to these preachers. They were sincere, right? They were even the ones who had their Bibles in a quick draw holster. <laughs> Epistle Ephesians 4.14, you know. <laughs> Pull the Bible out of their quick draw holster and, you know, who could get to the Bible quote faster. So they were, they wanted to really bring us the good news. And I had to flip it because it was kind of, you know, day after day after day, having somebody shout Bible passages in my ear as I was bowing. And but they, they wanted to save us. But the story and the method, the message was a very different one, which is, Bowing will not deliver you to liberation, right? Only by waiting for salvation through the blood of the Messiah, the Savior, was the only way to get free. So, all right. America happens to be a very religiously active society and culture. And uh, I certainly cut my teeth. I, I earned my proselytizing chops by being saved over and over and over and over again. So different stories about how to actually get free and what is freedom. So as I said just a minute ago, in the Buddhist, the Buddhist definition of freedom, what you get liberated from is the pressure of rebirth, right? The pressure of what pulls us back into a body. That's a pressure. That's a wind, they describe it. Um, there are numerous stories of people who have had near-death experiences um, in every culture, right? Uh, you can have a, a, a very well-educated 40-year-old uh, multiple-degree Jewish psychotherapist uh, woman who is wearing her, you know, fancy uh, Saks Fifth Avenue business suit uh, wearing a $700 watch who says, yes, um, 
I did die, and uh, I was following this light down towards, heading towards a light down this narrow passageway, and I was being pulled. I was got like no way to avoid it, and I was getting closer and closer to that light, and I wanted to go to see the light, and I, I realized I was out of my body, and everybody was behind me, and I was going up to the, and then I came back into my body, and I, it just wasn't my time to die, you know. There are lots and lots of these stories. Um, there was a period, what was it, Dr. Brian Weiss, I think, was the one who wrote the first book he collected. He was a, a, another psychotherapist who uh, collected and wrote a story about near-death experiences. Many, many lives, many masters. Many lives, many masters. And I think it was volume one, volume two, volume three. And this is already 30, 30 some, 40, 50 years ago that this came, came popular, but uh, it was a worldwide bestseller because why they discovered, my nose is itching here, that's what I'm telling you, that um, people worldwide had all, occasionally the, there were individuals who had had this experience of leaving their body, seeming to head towards uh, a travel, heading towards another destination, and then popping back into their bodies. And of course, the Buddhists, having been recording and collecting these stories for a thousand years, have a long, uh, a, a large library of visits to King Yama. That's our Buddhist language for what happens when you leave your body heading for the next one. They say you go to a realm where you're judged and all of your... <laughs> We call them offenses, not sins. It could be call them sins. All of your offenses appear on a screen behind you, every one. Your karmic record is being played out on a screen, they say, as you're kneeling there in front of a judge, of which there are 10, 10 King Yamas. Very bureaucratic, the way they describe it. And uh, the, <laughs> you get a chance. You get a chance to make your case. You can't bring a lawyer. You can't bargain. King Yama is described as a tie, let's say tie mian lao yan jun. They call him tie mian lao yan jun. Iron faced King Yama. And he says, All right, what good deeds did you do while you were alive? And he goes, Well, I did lots of good deeds. What did you do? Uh-huh. What evil deeds? Well, not very many, not very many evil deeds. He says, Okay, but take a look here. <laughs> Sometimes he calls in all the animals that you ate and they're, yeah, you ate my leg, you ate my drumstick, you ate my, you know. And so King Yama weighs it up, takes his gavel and goes, I don't have my wooden fish. He goes, bonk, hits the desk. You go off and be, you know, you're the, your next rebirth will be here. Your parents are waiting for you. And off you go. You know. That's the way they, this literature, this literature of seeking liberation and not being free is written, near-death experiences. So in these near-death experiences, they describe uh, coming back to life and realizing that between bodies, it's like a wind, they say. It's as if it were a wind blowing us along to the next place. How much freedom do we have at that point? And they always say none. You gotta go. You have no choice. Your, your, the wind of your deeds pro propels you. So, now, that's one story. Let's take another look at it. What about? Pure land, for example. Because there's another level of stories of liberation that's told in the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism that talks about the Pure Land. What is that? Huh, interesting. There is these stories, and it was absolutely, this is a story that the Buddha said to his monks. He said, oh monks, he said, you don't know about this story that I'm going to tell you now, but I want to tell you about a bhikshu whose name was Fazang, Dharma Treasury, who, when he was cultivating as a monk, he made vows. And what is a vow? A vow is heart's wish that you focus on 
with laser-like intensity. When I become a Buddha, said Bhikshu Fatsang, I'm going to make a land where there's no suffering. No more suffering. That's what I'm going to create. And anybody can go there if they recite my name. If they say Namo Amita Buddha, Namo Omitofo, right? Namo Amitabha, you can go there. In Japanese, Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, right? Anyone who says that name can go to this place that I'm going to create and be liberated from what? From suffering. Okay, that's the story. Okay, and the Buddha said, now, what do you think about that? And the pictures are going, oh, that's great vows. That's really good vows. 48 vows, said the Buddha about Amitabha. Now, I want to say that anybody who wants to know in detail about these should listen to Jin Fo, Bhikshu Jin Fo, Jin Fo Fasher's weekly lectures on the Sutra of uh, Limitless Life, Wuliang Shou, Wuliang Yi, Wuliang Shou, right? Um, he's the Sutra of Limitless Lifespan. And he lectures every week. And if you go to our, I'll put it right here. Where, oh, not that one. We want our notes page, 10 stage notes. Here we go. Here's our notes page. Go to, slide that down there. What I want you to do is go to www.berkeleymonastery.org. There we go. So if you go to berkeleymonastery.org, you will find, among other interesting, fascinating stories, that you are, yeah, uh, Bhikshu Jinfo's uh, weekly lecture on this story. He's talking about this story. It is a story. The Buddha told the monks, you don't know about this. You have to go hear that story. Now, likewise, I might say, our Bhikshu Jinho, Jinho Shur, our Dharma master at Berkeley Monastery, is also explaining another similar story of Pure Land, which is the Sutra of the Vows of the Buddha Medicine Master. Yao Shi Liu Li Guang Ru Lai Ban Yuan Gong De Jing, Sutra of the Past Fundamental Vows of Medicine Buddha of Lapis Lazuli Light, right? So those are two wonderful Buddhist stories about liberation, how to get free. And in fact, you can choose to go to the Pure Land in the West, Amitabha's Pure Land, or the Pure Land in the East, Medicine Buddha's Land of Lapis Lazuli Light. How about that? So, okay, I've got a uh, Tathagata's Treasury. That's what we're talking about. That light that is released from our nature when we clear off the things that obstruct it. Okay, liberation that accords with the unobstructed wheel is the next one. Lun What is that? That is a reference to yogic cultivation. The idea that when we practice through a certain gateway, there are wheels that turn. Uh, this is a, one of the symbols of Buddhism, the Dharma wheel, right? So this liberation accords with the unobstructed wheel of dharma, which can be right in part of your daily practice, right? A, dharma, a liberation that connects through three periods of time, past, present, and future, which in one sense are all abstractions. It's abstract. Show me the past. Uh, I know it happened. I ate breakfast, right? It's now noon, so... I know there's a future coming because I'll be hungry at dinner, right? So the three periods of time, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks at a period of time, four period of time, right? Snack time, tea time. The British have the fourth period of time. The Australians, Aussie afternoon tea, right? So, um, yeah, this, this liberation says, don't worry about those abstractions. There's one present moment that 
is so elastic, it fits everything right in it. What do you need to call in the past, present, and future? It's just one ongoing present. Well, we need, right? Here's my, this is, this is actually my boss. I'm wearing my boss on my wrist, my wristwatch, right? There it is, Seiko. It's, I obey it, right? When it tells me it's time to get up, I get up. So we need past, present, and future so we can be on time. Shan zhong wu li, zao wan bu zhi shi. Master Hua uh, gave Marty and me a, uh, a contemplation when we started our pilgrimage. He said, I live in the mountains. I have no calendar. Early or late, I keep no track of time. Shan zhong wu li, zao wan bu zhi shi. Right? So uh, I cultivate alone without the calendar here in the mountains. Early or late, I pay no attention to the time. <laughs> Somebody could say, yeah, but how do you know when your podcast is on? You know, how do you know when, you, when your meeting is due, right? So yeah. The treasury of the Dharma realm liberation. How do we explain that? Well, wouldn't it be nice if instead of, now we were talking about uh, the oppression, the lack of liberation of rebirth. So everybody who gets their, you know, their near death experience says that uh, they, there's no choice. There's a wind that blows you towards King Yama or towards that light. But then the people who tell the story say something happened and I'm back, right? They say that rebirth happens one of two ways. One is rebirth happens because your karma, the wind of your karma pulls you there. But there's a second kind of rebirth, that is the bodhisattva's rebirth, which is what? Vows, right? Imagine if when we die, we could say, my next rebirth is going to be there because somebody needs me to go there to help wake them up. That's called chetua. That's really zizai, right? Free. Uh, so to not have to obey the wind of karma, but instead to be able to choose where you're reborn. Mm. So karma forces us, oppresses us, pressures us, pushes us to one rebirth. But a bodhisattva says, huh, I would like to come back next time as a kookaburra, because I notice these kookaburras are not a lot happy, you know. There are a lot of stru strife in, in the world of birds. Somebody's always flying into your territory. You have to chase them away. And, and your kids are always hungry. They're, they're always hungry and you have to feed them. Not liberate, right? Of course, you ask a mother and a mother would say, oh, I didn't mind all the trouble you gave me. I was happy to get up at three in the morning and change your diaper, you know. Because moms are that way. That's what moms do. So, yeah. So it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? How we look at it. But, uh, so here is a bodhisattva who has the what? Treasury of the Dharma realm liberation. That is to say, they can go free in any rebirth that they choose. They are not pressured by karma, that wind. A wheel of light liberation. That's... Splendid, right? A wheel of light. And states without remainder. So there's no, everything is done precisely. Um, this is, it's a, I thought to share an idea, but it's a complex one. I don't know if I can communicate it, but when I first arrived at the Buddhist monastery in San Francisco, 
being a Berkeley grad student at the time, getting my master's degree, I lived in a commune in the Berkeley Hills. And uh, I shared across my back fence with the next door neighbors. Uh, we had two houses that were, uh, you could say, uh, colleagues. <laughs> uh, the house next door, I was, I was a grad student. I was 22, 23, 24, those years, that age. And I moved into the monastery at age 24. The group beside me, who lived beside me, were slightly older. They were professionals. They were, Karen was a nurse. And uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, they, were, they were out in the world of work. And they had, uh, they had a local dope dealer who drove up to the house occasionally. I would watch. He drove up in his Mercedes. Uh, his, uh, uh, he had a, 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 uh, um, a Rolls Royce. He drove in his Rolls Royce. Uh, he was a wealthy dope dealer. And his license plate was into it, meaning whatever it is, I'm into it, right? Meaning he's involved. And this was the kind of lifestyle that was happening next door. I was a grad student, so I had to shut my door and go back to my books. And I didn't, they had a hot tub. It was very much a California Bay Area, 1970s, early 70s scene. And uh, so when I got to the monastery, I brought all these expectations of what Buddhism was about with me to meet Master Xuanhua and my former college roommate who was already a bhikshu. And from the point of view of libertines living in the Berkeley Hills with our ethos being into it, whatever it is, I'm willing, you know, I will try it. To go to the monastery, it was a shock to me to realize no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no intoxicants. You know, if you took those guidelines, those shaping regulations that are conventions for, from 2,500 years and applied them to the lifestyle that I was living in the hills as a grad student, they were opposite ends of the spectrum, right? And I had no idea that the Buddhists were so sober, were so disciplined, and that in order to get really liberated and to get free, you had to give yourself some shape. You couldn't be into it and just whatever, dude, you know, oh, feels good, do it again. Let's go into the hot tub, you know, and uh, it was, it was a real sh awakening for me to realize that my teacher, Master Xuanhua, when he taught us in order to get to a place where he was tuned in to our state so he could aim a teaching at us, hopefully we would pick up on it, he had to be very, very precise. And the bodhisattva here that we're hearing about, this bodhisattva who's liberated, this comes from hard work and taking the flow, the inner flow of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, sight, sound, smells, taste, sensation, touch, and dharma, and tuning them to precision and transforming them. You can't be off by even a little. You can't say, well, you know, I was out with friends and they had a couple extra bottles of wine. And I mean, come on, we're young and we're out there, you know, plenty of time. It's a weekend and the sun was shining. Of course, I drank, you know, half a bottle of wine. Come back and meditate and you only want to sleep. You don't want to meditate, right? So the discipline required to get to where this bodhisattva is liberated, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? That if you really want to get free by the bodhisattva's description, you have to discipline yourself so that what so 
your mind answers you, not that you answer when your mind calls. Because why? The mind, before we get here, is full of what? Emotion, attachment, delusion, biases, right? Prejudices, blind spots, feelings. Oh, the generic name is ignorance. Our minds are half ignorant, half awake, half dark, half bright, half foggy, half shining, you know. And the Bodhisattva at this point has transformed and transformed and removed and removed and scrubbed away and scrubbed away ignorance bit by bit. So now when he or she has the slightest little movement of thought, the mind responds. And because the self that is the product of that delusion and ignorance is so subtle and gone, so, so far removed now, this bodhisattva can actually hear what we are thinking. How quiet does your mind have to be before you pick up on what other people are thinking and know how to help them, right? That's real liberation. All right, now, one more point, one more point here. The, um, if you look at the life of an arhat, let's say, for example, which is a saint, a sage in every tradition, right? In any tradition. Uh, somebody at this point of discipline is just admirable to the max. This is just an amazing person who is able to end birth and death, but they don't take that next step to where they're able to listen to others and they stick around. They could get liberation, but they don't seek it until everyone else goes first. That's another level of commitment and discipline and dedication, right? So not easy, but I mean, I can't imagine that you could go through that door and say, I'm gone, I'm set free, bye bye, you know? And then you say, yeah, I'll hold on a little bit because I look back and everybody else is still stuck in that web. They haven't let go of the things that they cling to out of fear, out of confusion, out of owing debts, right? So. These 10 are foremost, limitless hundreds of thousands of Pasamkhyas of gateways to liberation and all. And here in the 10th stage, at this level, the Bodhisattva realizes them all. Likewise, Samadhis, Dharanis, psychic powers, he fully realizes all those incredible gateways. Yeah, yeah, set me free. So here's an interesting theory. Um, China has been a Buddhist, a country where Buddhism is available now for 2000 years plus, right? And the most popular Buddhist practice in China and wherever the Chinese diaspora went around the world um, the most popular method of practice is Pure Land, is reciting the name of Amitabha or Medicine Buddha. Um, and people are curious. They, that's, they don't think, they, they think, oh, it must be meditation, right? Because we Westerners, where Buddhism has come out, we meditate. But who recites the name of the Buddha Amitabha? We don't know that story. That story has not been told here in Australia much, right? It's not, quote, popular the way it is in China, Korea, Japan, Nepal, Tibet, right? Mahayana countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam. There, if you go there, Buddhists recite the name of Amitabha. Okay, why? How, what, what's the difference? Well, my thought, see what you think about this theory. Here in uh, Australia, in America, where I come from, people have many ways to postpone suffering. <laughs> cool. 
dukkha is a pressure. It ties you down and doesn't let you get free. China is a country that knew a lot about dukkha over the centuries. If you, and China was largely agrarian, right? Farmers, 90% until just this last century when education and literacy became universal by and large. Um, in China, you were at the mercy of the weather if you're a farmer, right? Here come the locusts. Oh man, there are locusts now in Africa. And after the locusts come, then you get the dust cloud, the dust, because it hasn't rained long enough. And the Yellow River Basin has now blown up into the air. So there's following the locust was the drought. Then comes the flood and the Yellow River is flooding its banks. And so you, you're, you know, insects and then drought and then flood. Then who comes? Oh, the tax collector comes. This is a particularly greedy administration emperor and he wants your money, he wants your grain. Then comes who the bandits come through and they steal what you, after the harvest, you, anybody who saw Seven Samurai, you know, that Kurosawa film knows about the bandits who are coming in to steal your stuff. And then after that comes the army and the army comes through because there's a rebellion and the army needs conscripts, they take your son and your horse, you know. Then, oh, so life was this way. It was a lot of suffering. At that time, if you are poor, what do you do? Well, here comes the Buddhist who says, you know what? There is dukkha. This is dukkha. Do you recognize it? There is a way to get liberated, jietoa, from dukkha, which is what? Recite the Buddha's name and you will go to the pure land you will become set free from suffering of all kinds. And people go, yes, I want it, right? Well, in the 20th and 21st century in the educated West, we have lots of ways to delay the arrival of dukkha. What? Well, alcohol being one, drugs being another. Uh, what else? Prescription drugs? right? Painkillers, uh, tranquilizers, right? Uh, retail therapy, retail shop, get your credit card, go buy something, go on to YouTube, go on to Amazon, go on to eBay and delay suffering. Uh, entertainment, right? Just Netflix, right? All these different ways that we can forget that we're in pain. Come a pandemic, the coronavirus arrives. Hmm. It's possible that America is now, and the world is now experiencing inescapable dukkha. Maybe for the first time. America has a history that doesn't even extend to the Tang Dynasty. China knows their history for 5,000 years. America hasn't been here for 300 years. So this is a new experience. Where are you gonna to run to? Who are you gonna call when you're quarantined for the second time and you know that you're on your savings and there's no leadership showing us what to do to get out of our situation? That's dukkha, that's pressure, that's suffering, that's kuo in Chinese. What are we gonna do at a time like that? When taking a pill, won't do it. How many days can you get drunk before you, you just have to get sober again? All right. One answer to that is music. And one of the best things that America has contributed to the world, no apology, is blues. Blues music because the blues is our answer to suffering. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Where did the blues come from? Not from white folks. Blues came from people who were not able, who were in the exact same situation as the Chinese peasants, farmers who needed relief, right? African-Americans came uh, not of their own accord, 
and were right in that same situation. They had to find a way to get rid of the pain. So what did they do? They didn't have Amitabha story. They had music. And I wanted to share one of the best songs to come out in the last 10 or 15 years, Gillian Welch and David Rawlings, particularly Gillian Welch, uh, wrote a song called Hard Times. Here it is. This song helps. There was a camp town man. He used to plow and sing. He loved his mule and the mule loved him. When the day got long, as it does about now, I'd hear him singing to his muley cow calling, come on, my sweet old girl. I'll bet the whole damn world we're going to make it yet to the end of the row. Right? He's, he's plowing. He's got to get down to the end of the row. He's just having fun with his mule getting to the end of the row. What is he singing? Hard times ain't going to rule my mind. Hard times ain't going to rule my mind, Bessie. Hard times ain't going to rule my mind no more. So how beautiful, right? This is what you say when times get hard. You say, no, I, my mind is liberated. My mind is free. It is hard times. My mind is free. It's a mean old world, heavy in need. That big machine is just a picking up speed. We're supping on tears and we're supping on wine. We all get to heaven, the pure land, in our own sweet time. So come all you Asheville boys, turn up your old time noise and kick till the dust comes up from the cracks in the floor. Singing hard times ain't gonna rule my mind, brother. Hard times ain't gonna rule my mind. Hard times ain't gonna rule my mind no more, right? But the camp town man, he doesn't plow anymore. I've seen him walking down to the cigarette store. I guess he lost that knack. He forgot that song. Woke up one morning and his mule was gone. So come all you ragtime kings, come on you dogs and sing. Pick up your dusty old horn and give it a blow. Playing hard times ain't gonna rule my mind. Hard times ain't gonna rule my mind. Hard times ain't gonna rule my mind anymore. So this one, this is where she extends it out from the farmer behind his plow. The big old machine picking up speed is just, you know, 21st century, the uh, multinational corporations maximizing profits for the same 200 families, right? Supping on tears, supping on wine. This is a literary reference to the songs of Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster wrote the wonderful song called A Hard Times, uh, uh, stay away from my cabin door, you know. And there's something on tears there. Asheville boys, old time noise, beautiful song. So this is uh, Gillian Welch's medicinal music. And look at the comments. I, I was looking at the comments on the internet, uh, people who listened to her sing, and they said, lyrics so raw and honest, both tragic and beautiful simultaneously. Reminds us of the grapes of wrath. Some people call it the great American novel. <coughs> we need this song now more than ever. And here in the time of COVID-19, it has a totally new meaning. In the age of overwhelming distractions, bad news, noise, and confusion, your soul can find peace and serenity when I listen to this song. This is music that matters. Poets, God blessed, blessed by God. Someone else said, this is one of the best songs ever written and performed. Sparse music played in a style that's the soundtrack for hard times of any sort. Lyrics so raw and honest and crafted to build a complete experience, powerful symbolism. I've been the farmer, sometimes I've been the mule. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to share this song because I really think um, it's not entirely accurate to say that America has not been through the hard times that China knew. We have, we've had our civil war, we've had our depression, um, but who are we talking about? If 
we were African Americans, if we were Native Americans, we know hard times. And uh, now it's come home. Now Duca has arrived. So what do we what do we have? We have the blues. It was a camp town man used to plow and sing. He loved the mule and the mule loved him. When the day got long, as it does about now, I hear him sing into his muley cow, calling, come on my sweet old girl. I'll bet the whole damn world We're gonna make it yet To the end of the road Seeing hard times Ain't gonna rule my mind Said it's a mean old world, heavy me. Big machine is just a picking up speed. We're supping on tears, we're supping on wine. We get to heaven in sweet time. Come on, you Asheville boy. up your old time noise kick till the dust comes up from the cracks in the floor singing hard times And this last verse takes it right into timelessness. But that camp town man, he don't plow no more. Seen him walk into the cigarette store. Guess he lost that knack. He forgot that song. Woke up one morning and he was gone. All you ragtime kings, come all you dog and sing. Pick up your dusty old home and give it a blow. Playing hard. That's Gillian Welch's Hard Times. Thank you for that song, Gillian Welch. Okay, I'm gonna give my banjo a tune here. And um, we are, uh, one of the signs of hard times and our, our coping is when songs emerge. Uh, they arise because we need them. Right? And Janice Ian, bless her heart, 
wrote a song that I want to share as well. Um, let me ask, you know, there's American Sign Language and there's Australian Sign Language. Is there Chinese Sign Language? Yo, maha. Dajia do kui sign, right? Yang, uh huh. So, a little different. There, there is one. Okay. So, when there's deaf and dumb, yaba, hoji, long, zi, huh? Okay. So, Janice Ian, who wrote the song Better Times Will Come and asked us to sing it in all the languages we could find, she wrote me this week and said, could you please find out if there's Chinese sign language because she wants to do a sign version. And so now we know there is one. So, okay, good. Um, we're gonna do this to do a little bit more music today because uh, America is currently, uh, Australia as well, but not by any degree the same. America has now had 50,000 cases in a day, right? How many? 57,000 new, new infections and no leadership bringing us together. No coping. It's just figure it out yourself, right? So we need these songs. And uh, this one I've recorded on YouTube. If anybody wants to go look for uh, Better Times Will Come, uh, Hung Shur, Reverend Hung Shur, give it a listen uh, in Mandarin. <laughs> I'll, we can do a, a bilingual version here. Here we go. Here we go. Better times, better times will come, better times. Better times will come when this world learns to live as one. Oh, better times will come. Here's the Chinese. Ming Tian, Ming Tian Wei Gong Ha, Ming Tian, Ming Tian Wei Gong Ha, Shi Jie Bu Xie Xing Da Tong, Ming Tian Li Ding Wei Gong Ha. When we greet each dawn without fear, knowing loved ones soon will be near. When the winds of war cannot blow anymore, oh, better times will come. Mindui kunan, how bu wei ju, qin peng hao yo, bu li bu qi. Better times, better times will come, better times, better times will come, when this world learns to live as one, oh, better times will come, though we live each day as our last we know someday soon it will pass we will dance we will sing in that never-ending spring oh better times will come last time better times better times will come better times better times will come this world learns to live as one. Oh, better times will come. Thank you, Janice Ian, for that. My goodness. Um, Janice released that and said, anybody who wants to take the song and sing it or paint it or dance it, um, she will put it on her YouTube channel. And I think now 100 different people have done so. Uh, it's just everywhere, you know, people are really doing, they're doing it in classical interpretations, Japanese translations, uh, wonderful. Now, the Buddhists are contributing to um, music that helps us get through the hard times, right? What is it? This is our medicine Buddha mantra. Uh, this 
This is medicine. This is medicine, invisible medicine, healing on the soul level, level of the soul, right? Medicine Buddha by Sajiraj Guru, Vaidurya Prabhasa Tathagata. That's a Sanskrit name. Buddha of lapis lazuli light who quells disasters and lengthens life. He um, has a sutra. And in that sutra, the Buddha who told the story, Shakyamuni, included this mantra. That's the melody. Ready? Ready to do it? We'll do it three times. Here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate I Sajjaguru I Durya Prabharajaya Mahatagataya Arhate Samyak Samudaya Pete Seeger at this point would say, everybody sing along. <laughs> sing along in Sanskrit. Last time. Here we go. People have been looking at my desktop today and wondering, who is that? What are we looking at? This is a refuge and precept ceremony. Um, it happened here at the Gold Coast a few years ago. Some of those friendly faces in the front row, we can see. We've got uh, our current, both of our translators are sitting on either side of me. We've got Dr. Wong. And we've got Dr. Wong, Cliff and, and Kevin, and their respective spouses, Karina and Sonny, and their kids sitting right there, having taken refuge, and behind us, all of our Dharma friends here at the Gold Coast. This is from last year. And I wanted to share with you two photographs. One is 1972 Gold Mountain Monastery. Look at this picture. Talk about cool, right? Dukkha, and yet nobody seems particularly oppressed by this level of Dukkha. Here is Master Shrenhua, right? Something has set them free. Look at the haircuts in the photo. These are known as the California Dreamers, and they are disciples of Sufi Sam, Sam Lewis, Murshid Sam Lewis, who, after he died, uh, Sam Lewis was a famous Sufi in, Amer in San Francisco during the Summer of Love in the Haight-Ashbury. And uh, he died, and his disciples, 
I think six of them had a dream in which Sufi Sam came to them in the dream and said, go to Gold Mountain Monastery and take refuge with Master Shenhua. So they came and they, our teacher told us to come. What's refuge? So Shifu organized a refuge ceremony. And sure enough, this is 1972. Here is Bhikshuni Hung Shur, the first five monks and nuns. Here's Ron Epstein, earliest disciples. Look at these kids. These children in the front row are all grown up with children of their own now. But here is Master Shenhua. This was San Francisco in 1972. So I have another photograph, which is Taken Refuge 1973. And if you look carefully, you'll see a tall er American in a sports jacket with a mustache. That's me when I took refuge the next year, 1973. And uh, going right over here, we have some, here's Madalena, Tam, Tam Wujia, and the Sangha has grown. Here is Bhikshu Hong Kong, right there, Richard Josephson. Yeah, so this is the scene. This is what it was like. Here's Alan Nicholson. What it was like in the early days of Buddhism in America, getting things started, 1973, right? So this is me having just taken refuge and gotten the name Bo Zhan and being told that I was given that name, the fruit of the truth, because I told too many lies. <laughs> Immediately, Master Hua was teaching me, right? So there are some kinds of dukkha that don't need liberating. That was a very valuable lesson for me. Okay, we have a message from Mission Control saying there's 176 on YouTube. You have 66. Okay, 60 on the Chinese channel. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for joining this week again. Uh, next week, we're going, let's, let's quickly look ahead. What's coming up next week in the 10th stage? Um, our Bodhisattva uh, accords with limitless Bodhi, power of mindfulness. Um, we're going to find out uh, now it shifts. We, we finish now with the list of 10 of 10 of 10 of 10 of 10 of 10 of this and that. Now we're going to go to the uh, series in the text where the analogy to the great clouds of Dharma rain come in. This is called the, uh, the, um, uh, the stage, the 10th stage of the Dharma cloud. At the next, uh, our next lecture, we get a description of what that means. Why is it a cloud of Dharma? Right? So that's coming up next week. So don't miss it. Um, Jin Chuan, Jin Fu, Jin Wei, Jin Husher, do you guys have any announcements to make? Anything that people in California might want to know? Jin Fu, Jin Fu, do you want to say anything? Okay. So we have uh, our Amitabha session still going on starting tomorrow at 8 a.m. But if you want to join us for a whole day of Dharma assembly, you can start joining at 5 a.m. for our morning chanting, 6.15 morning meditation, 7.30 we have uh, three steps, one bow still, but we'll finish a little bit early. Then 8 a.m. we have our Amitabha session. Uh, and then we still have our afternoon Guan Yin and Amitabha recitation from 12 to 1 p.m. We'll have a kind of a Dharma practice Q&A um, China talking a bit about answering questions around doing a session from one to two. And then the ceremonies will start from two to four. And we'll have our final transference at 4 p.m. to probably 4.30, 4.45, where we'll um, send off all the pieways that have been put, put up. So we have over a thousand pieways. Just for a fun story, I just got an email from someone who said somebody had a dream that that of a relative that wanted to put their pie up. So we have to put another pie up for somebody else. So <laughs> oh, kind of a fun dream. <laughs> somebody, somebody in a dream said, put up a pie for someone else. No, no, sorry. I, I got that wrong, but uh, yeah, it's actually got a something. message from Madalena. She sent okay, me a, for, a, for a pie because she said one of the, her volunteers, I think said that they had a relative that showed up in her, his dream 
and wanted to put up a pieway. So she sent me and ask for a pieway. So we asked for a pieway at Berkeley. In a dream. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Oh, so you know, no. I said, okay, so Madalena. That, that requires you guys to be extra sincere. <laughs> yeah. You have to be really sincere because it's this is counting, you know, yeah. starting to to penetrate other realms. So yeah. Good so, stuff. Um, so yeah, so that would be the whole the whole Dharma assembly, and we finish at at 4 30 so if people want to join you see a river home shares website there um just click the bbm online link and uh please register for a zoom link but essentially after you register you'll have all of our that link will work for all of our dharma events at okay. bbm for the for the online i session. just did it. i clicked on that link and see what happens you click the link that says bbm online registration and up comes this form it's simple email address give us your name where are you how did you find out do you want to join the newsletter any comments submit it and you're in and yeah. then you're welcome to join that way we control who comes and goes and it's a little more manageable right so don't be afraid of that form uh, it's easy to do it's bilingual so we've had probably about 250 people regularly attend so it's been quite a, That's great. a lot of people that's great. That's way better than when we're not under quarantine, <laughs> sadly, you know, so, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, and you can also hear on the Berkeley Monastery website, you can also find all our other activities right here, including uh, Sutra Lectures by Dharmaster Jin Fu, Infinite Life Sutra, Dharmaster Jin He, Medicine Buddha Sutra, and Bowing, um, three steps, one bow every day, meditation every day. Lots of ways to practice while you're at home to help us get through this uh, pandemic and also create a lot of merit for yourself and for others that you can transfer to. So, okay, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Shall we dedicate the merit now and see you all next week? May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with life, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving, Unity. May our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night because our hearts are one this world of pain turns into paradise may all become compassionate and wise may all become compassionate and wise may all become compassionate and why may it be so i've got a handbell here i will ring it three times and people are welcome if you care to to do some half bows from wherever you're sitting or full bows if you can and then we'll see you next week Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Gratitude to all the hardworking volunteers who put this lecture online. Momiko, see you.